Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today we're starting a brand new series entitled Faith Revisited. We did a series on faith a while back, but I want to revisit the topic of faith and explore it a little bit more, go a little bit deeper, maybe um, redefine what faith is. So we came up with this, this series entitled Faith Revisited. Today's message, part one, is entitled The Catalyst. I believe faith is the catalyst for all miracles. If we're going to see miracles, if we're going to see signs and wonders, if we're going to see great healings, we got to have faith. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to explore a little bit more, dig a little deeper into this faith. And Jesus, Jesus often said, let it be unto you according to your faith. You see, faith is a difficult um, thing to pin down. It's kind of elusive, yet it's easy to have. It always seems to be right there at your fingertips. But somehow, we just can't seem to grab hold of it sometimes. And it just seems to slip right through our fingers and it's gone. But without faith, we will not receive anything, not even our salvation, because it's by faith that we're saved. Everything that we believe is based on faith. And now, our first message in our Faith Re Revisited series is called The Catalyst. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 through 2. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. The writer of the book of Hebrews begins his 11th chapter of his letter with, uh, that, that chapter 11 is known as, the faith chapter. And he begins that chapter with, now faith is. Now faith is what? Well, apparently, it is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Which puts a definition to it, but not really much help or much assistance in helping me to understand what faith is really is and to grab a hold of this faith and put it into action but at least it's way better than what the king james told us he said now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen but what exactly does that mean the substance I understand what the evidence is, but the substance caught me a little bit off guard. That leaves me where I can define faith, but I just can't really or fully comprehend what it is. Because sometimes I feel like I have a mountain of faith and my problem is only a mustard seed, but I just can't seem to get my faith into action. Well, I think it goes back to that substance thing. I believe that the ESV was a bit clearer. He said, it is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things that we do not see. In other words, there are things that we have, but we do not fully possess them. I understand, and I need you to understand, that we have things, things that God has given us, but we have not taken possession of those things as yet. It's ours, it belongs to us, but we just haven't reached out and taken hold of it as yet. We have such things as adoption, as sons and daughters, 
or the redemption of our bodies. But we, we haven't taken possession of that yet because the time has not come for that, for us to take possession of that. We have eternal life, but we haven't attained it as yet because Christ has not returned. We have perfection, but we have not mastered it as yet. But we work forward to that, to that point, that thing in time. We have the peace that passes all understanding, even if we don't realize it as yet, even if we haven't put it into action as yet. We have spiritual gifts, even if we haven't fully possessed it or, 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 or have, haven't fully purposefully used them as yet. For example, we have hospitality. We may not have used it, but we have the gift of, of hospitality. We have the gift of encouragement. We have the gift of healing. We can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover because the prayer of faith will heal the sick. So we have these spiritual benefits like gifts, the anointings, and even if we haven't taken possession of them as yet, they're still ours. And we normally haven't taken possession of them because we haven't realized that we have them or we haven't taken the time to, to study for ourselves or the time has not come for these things to manifest themselves in our lives, in our ministries. See, Romans chapter 8, verse 23 through 25 says this, And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for something or for what he sees? And if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. If you think about it, that's literally the definition of faith. We're hope for something that we don't actually see. It hasn't manifested itself yet because we haven't either declared the word because Job says, you shall decree a thing and it shall be established for you. Meaning, if we had achieved, right, or possessed salvation or the redemption of our bodies already, we could do whatever we want to do or anything that we feel like doing without any types of consequences because whatever we have if we have already attained a thing, once we attain it, you see, once we have it, once we grab hold of it, it can no longer be taken away from us. That's why Adam and Eve had to be driven out of the garden because if they had took hold of that fruit of eternal life, they would have lived forever and they would have lived forever in their sinful state. So God had mercy on them and drove them out of the garden. So these things, if we have taken possession of a thing, then it is ours. It is ours forever. So we have to get hold of this thing that is called faith because that's how we're going to live throughout all eternity, by faith. But since we have not attained um, our complete salvation, we wait for that in hope. We, we hope for that because when Jesus returns, he comes to get us and he adopts us as sons and daughters. And there we will be with him forever and ever and ever. And nothing and no one can ever take that away from us ever again. So, not that we are unsure of salvation. We are sure of it. But we must hold on for our hope of salvation in strict obedience until Jesus is revealed in us on that great day of his appearing. And with him, as I said, he will bring all of our rewards with him. Everything that we've done will be rewarded for those things that we have done in faith. 
You see, we don't realize that we are loaded down with spiritual benefits. Psalms 103 talks about this. It says, forget not all of his benefits. Uh, Psalms 103 tells us, do not forget any, any of the benefits that we have in Christ. We're to think about them. We're to put them into action. We're to incorporate them in our day-to-day -day life because they are our benefits. They're not to be put on the back burner. They're not to be forgotten. We're to remember them because they are a gift from our God to us. We have so many benefits, so many privileges. And the thing is, we have not taken possession of the majority of those things that God has given us because of spiritual ignorance. We simply have not been taught our benefits. We don't know what our benefits are. Or spiritual laziness. We have not taken the time to study our Bibles for ourselves. If we're not told or if we're not taught, we simply don't know. And we won't know because we won't spare the time to study on our own. Either way, faith is the catalyst that puts our spiritual gifts or our spiritual benefits into motion. In other words, faith is the catalyst or the vehicle that drives signs, wonders, and miracles and performs many great acts of healing. Miracles that no one can deny. Without faith, we cannot accomplish any of these things. It is the faith that puts them into motion. For by it, by faith, we live and we receive. Like Hebrews chapter 11 verse 2 says, For by it, the people of old receive their commendation. By what? By faith. By faith, those people, those saints of old, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of those, they received their commendation. Or in other words, were mentioned. They, they, they were worthy to be mentioned. They were worthy to, to attract attention. It was their faith. For it was faith that they exercised that made them noteworthy. Therefore, we too must put our faith into action. So, what is this faith? Well, it's still, that still didn't quench my desire to know and to understand what faith was so that I could put it into action in my life, so that I can reach out and take hold of it. Because faith is frequently thrown around. Faith, have faith. You just got to believe. Okay, how? How How do I do that? So I began digging a little deeper into this thing called faith. Because according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. If then it is impossible to please God without faith, it would behoove me and you to find out or to understand what exactly this faith is all about. Because I cannot, and neither can you, afford to be caught dead or alive without faith. We just can't, if faith is that important. So as I said, I dug a little bit deeper, and I found that the English word faith appears 336 times in the King James Version. 378 times in the New American Standard Bible. 389 in the New King James Version. 458 times in the New International Version. And in the Good News Version, this is so appropriate, 521 times. Because faith is the good news. So 521 times, that's a lot of appearances. If the word faith was an entertainer, it would be one of the hardest working words in show business. But faith is not an entertainer. It is a multifaceted weapon that doubles as an 
indispensable tool. I want to say that again, just in case that you're taking notes. I said, faith is a multifaceted weapon that doubles as an indispensable tool. You know, I heard three very short stories that I want to use as an illustration to try to strip away the complexity of this word faith. The story goes like this. Once, a certain village had no rain for a very long time. So all of the villagers got together and they decided to come together on a certain day to pray for rain. On the day of the corporate prayer, all the people gathered in the village square. But only one little boy brought an umbrella. That is expectant faith. That little boy came expecting. Faith is expectation that something will happen. Elijah, after killing the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, got down on his knees and began to pray fervently for rain. So he kept sending his servant to go and look. The servant would come back and he'd say, he sees nothing. So he would pray some more, then he would send him again. He did this seven times. Elijah continued praying again and again and again. He kept sending his servant again and again and again. He prayed until something happened. Finally, his servant came back and he said, he see a cloud the size of a man's fist rising up over the horizon. Just a small, insignificant thing. Just a small fist-sized cloud in the distance. But it was a cloud nonetheless. And Elijah said, that is enough. Let's get out of here because a rainstorm is coming. That is expectancy. That is prayer expecting something to happen. That is faith in action. The second illustration is this. When you throw a baby in the air, she laughs because she, she knows you will catch her. That is blind faith. Believing without seeing, knowing without perceiving. You don't have to see it to believe it. You just know it. You know that it will happen. My little granddaughter, the youngest one, loves for me to toss her in the air and catch her. She thinks it's the most fun she's ever had. She knows that her papa is going to catch her every time. And she loves it. She, she giggles and she coos and she, she laughs. She has a good time because she knows that she expects that I will catch her. That's blind faith. We must put our trust in God. The things are the things that we ask our Lord. He will answer favorably and he will do it for us. He will grant us our request because we ask according to his will. We must believe that he will do the right thing by us, no matter what. That is blind faith. We don't see it. We just know it. The third goes like this. Every night we go to bed without any assurance of waking up the next morning. But still, we set our alarm to wake us up in the morning without even thinking about it. That is hope. See, we have expectant faith. We have blind faith and we have hope faith. All of these require us to be sure of receiving those things that we do not yet possess and being convinced even though we do not see it. We believe it. Faith is a strong, unshakable belief that we already have received whatever it is we have asked for. Even if we do not see it, we know we already have it. Because our God is a good, good God. He is a good, good Father. And He will not, not deny us just to deny us. 
I found that the Greek word pistis, translated faith, is used two different ways in scripture. It's really, really subtle. You, you, you really miss it if you've never seen it before or if you've never studied the original Greek. And even then, you will still easily miss it because it is so subtle. What am I rambling on about? Well, it's easier for me to show you than to tell you. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. Through, nine, through 10, 8, 9, and 10. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. He had 12 disciples. He had three inner circle. He had the 72. He had the 120. But yet Jesus said, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. The other thing that I noticed is that the centurion realized and understood the correlation between faith and authority. With faith comes authority, and authority requires faith in order for them to operate. Faith needs authority. If we're going to drive this vehicle called faith, we too must understand the relationship between or the connection between faith and authority. Now, I want to draw your attention to the other portion of the scripture that I mentioned earlier. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Again, if you notice, faith is coupled with authority. Jesus had the authority to forgive sins on the earth. Now, look at the word Jesus used here. He used the Greek word pistis. The same word he used with the centurion, but with a subtle variation. That little subtleness that I spoke to you earlier about. Here is what is actually written, but it's not translated. It didn't come out in the translation. This is what is written. And when Jesus saw their, the faith, that is what the Greek says. And when Jesus saw there the faith, let, let me give you an example of the, the faith. Luke chapter 7, verse 48, 49, and 50. It says, And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the faith. The belief in who Jesus is. The Lord of lords. The King of kings. He is God incarnate. That is who Jesus is. That knowledge gives us a better understanding of the kind of faith Jesus was referring to. But I want us to analyze these two scriptures or these two portions of scriptures a little bit more. Like in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus was talking to a centurion. A centurion was a Roman soldier, a army commander, if you will. He understood authority. He understood obedience. He had heard all that Jesus had been doing. He had heard all that Jesus was still doing. It was just something in the past. It was a now word. Jesus was still doing these great and mighty things. So Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. 
When we quote that scripture, we normally say, through the word of God. But that is not the word of God, per se. But rather, it's the word of Christ. There's a big, big difference. But we're going to touch a little bit more on that portion of scripture in our, in our message, How to Attain Faith, in this series. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, more about that, so watch out for that. For now, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. And that is what the centurion had. The centurion had a word of Christ. So his faith was stirred up within him. He believed the stories he had heard. He probably verified the claims and found them to be genuine. He had expectant faith. He was expectant expecting something to happen. When he went to Jesus, he just didn't go there unexpected or, or, or go there in doubt. He went there expecting Jesus. And, and it comes out clearly in what he said. He said, you don't even have to come to my house. All you got to do is to say the word. He had expected faith. Actually, he was expecting the very thing that he had come to ask Jesus for. His servant to be healed. He believed what he saw. He believed what he heard. He believed the word of Christ spoken to him. Therefore, faith took root in this man, this, this Roman centurion, a warrior, a fighter. He believed Jesus, who is the word made flesh. So now, look at what Jesus tells the crowd about the centurion. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. It is the simple Greek word, pestis. Now, let us examine the other portion of scripture. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Again, Jesus uses this word pistis meaning faith, but this time he adds something that is not translated in English because it seems to be redundant to the translators. But remember, Jesus never uses or deals in redundancies. But anyway, the word is oh. Now, I want you to watch this. Look at this. According to the dictionary of biblical languages with Semitic domains, the Greek New Testament, and I want to quote them. They quote, quote, of the almost 20,000 occurrences in the New Testament, about half, that's 10,000, are not translated in the NIV. When it is translated, it mostly represents the English word, the. So now, Jesus is still using this Greek word, pistis, but this time he puts the word the in front of it. And someone will say, oh, but Kenny. Brother Kenny, that means absolutely nothing. Let me just remind you what we established just a few minutes ago. Jesus never does anything or says anything arbitrarily or for no reason because Jesus does not deal in redundancies. He is the word who became flesh and that word is alive and active and it is not a dead and redundant word. It's alive and active. So, make no mistake, Jesus has a reason for this. And it is easily missed unless you study it and contemplate on it so that the Holy Spirit can quicken it to your spirit. Here's the difference. In the first instance, the centurion, but you know what? Hold on. I, I want to, to define faith for you first. So, I want to define faith in terms that we can use terms that we can understand 
I want you to understand this, these two, the differences between these two faiths. Faith, pistis, is the belief that the word of God is true and that he did do and can still do what he has said or claimed. As in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, by faith, pistis, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are invisible. This faith, pistis, is the belief that God is who he said he is and can do what he says he can do. Now look at this next scripture, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Now, this word translated, their faith, is actually the Greek word, oho, which translated the. So, it should actually read like this. And all these, though commended through the faith, Ohopistus did not receive what was promised. You see, the writer of the book of Hebrews was not talking about their faith, but rather he was describing something more, something greater than their faith in what God told them. They was talking about the faith. See, all the way up until then, in chapter 11, which again, I want to remind you, is the faith chapter, the writer uses the simple version, pistis, in its simple form. But when he begins to talk about the faith with which they were commended, he uses that complex word, oho, pistis, the faith. They were commended the faith. This suggests to me that it is not just a regular faith, but it is a special supernatural belief. Let me see if I can, can, can explain it with a definition. Pistis, in its simple form, is used to receive only. It's used to receive. Let me see if I can put a definition. The confidence, and this is the definitions I came up with. The definition of the trust and the trustworthiness of the reliability and the assurance in the power of God. It is just a simple belief that God can do what he said he can do. It's a belief that God is who he said that he is. Now, the faith, ohopistis, is the complex form of the word faith. And it is used as a catalyst that drives miracles. It means this, faith or believing as in a personal relationship to Christ, the acceptance of the message as in kerygma. Let me define this word kerygma so that we can have a full understanding of what I'm saying here, what is being said. Kerygma is translated preaching, but it is not just any old preaching. This is what kerygma means. It is the preaching of the gospel message having a focus on what's being preached as opposed to the act of just plain old preaching. In other words, it is the proclamation of the death and resurrection and exaltation of Jesus that leads to an evaluation of his person as both Lord and Christ and confronts one with the necessity of repentance. And that is what the apostles' message was all about. Every one of the apostles, every one of the, the, the early church fathers, those who went out and preached, even Philip, one of the deacons, one of the first deacons, went out and preached the death, resurrection, and exaltation of Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior. They preached Jesus as the omnipotent God, the almighty God, the judge of all the earth. And so now that we have a def definition with the simple faith and the complex faith, it is plain to see that the difference in our examples of the two portions of scriptures mentioned before. Let me just remind ourselves about the centurion. 
Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. That's pistis. That's the simple faith. And now the paralytic in Matthew chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, this is the complex pistis. Oho pistis. He said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. See, Matthew chapter 8 was just the plea. Pistis. There's no record, no indication that there was a change in the centurion or that he made a commitment or pledged fealty to Jesus. He just merely believed that Jesus could do what he asked him to do. He had a faith in the power of the name of Jesus. Now look at the Jews. Matthew chapter 9 verse 2. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. This time Matthew uses, when Jesus saw their faith, oh, pistis, the complex faith. And now look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line or the take home is, Faith is the catalyst or the vehicle that drives a spiritual experience that produces miracles. And we are in the driver's seat. We, we, if we want to see miracles, if we're going to see miracles, we must preach the faith. Oho pistis. The man in our last example had a spiritual experience. He and his friends believed that Jesus was their Messiah. They believed and he received his miracle and had his sins forgiven on the bargain. And speaking of having sins forgiven, have you had your sins forgiven? Have you come to the faith, that strong belief in the gospel message of Jesus Christ? of Jesus and him crucified, dead and buried, and raised again to life on the third day, now seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercessions for us. Have you come to that belief? Have you come to that faith? Do you wait for his return with great expectancy? If you haven't, but you would like to, if you would like to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior, you can. Here's how. All you have to do is just repeat this prayer after me. Believe it with your heart and you will be saved. Just mean it. Believe it. And Jesus will see it and he will save you. Here's, here's the prayer. If you want to be saved, if you want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, Repeat this, repeat this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I ask you to help me to receive that faith, that complex faith. Oh, pistis. That faith. The faith that saves. The faith that heals. The faith that changes lives. Help me to receive that, Father. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that simple prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get yourself a Bible. A Bible that you can understand. ESV, the, the English Standard Version is a good version. Get that. Read the Bible and highlight the New King James, if you want that one, that's a good one. Highlight those, those, those promises that God has made to us. Memorize them. Commit scripture to memory. 
Find yourself a Bible-believing church, one who still believes in holiness, who still believes in righteousness, not one who, who, who runs in after the ways of the world, who are friends with the world. Those are not the church that, that Jesus Christ is coming back to. He's coming back to the blood-bought, those who are holding on. To be a friend of the world is to be at enmity with God. Do not be a friend of the world. They're not for you. They're against you. Believe in Jesus. Believe in his resurrection. Believe in him paying the penalty for your sins. He loves you. He's given everything to purchase you. Purchase you back from death. He's given you eternal life. All you have to do is to receive it by faith. So if you pray that prayer, he's faithful and just and he will forgive you. And when he comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you're supposed to be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter in to the joy of the Lord. And there you'll be with him forever and ever. No more tears, no more worries, no more hunger, no more thirst, no more bad things. God only has good things in store for us. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want you to join us next week for our continuation in this series on faith, faith revisited. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.